Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, and I produce these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Every once in a while, we do a slightly different chat, and today I'm doing a chat in Amsterdam with Mario Delat. You may notice behind us that we have a wonderful image of the village people, and boy, didn't everyone love the village people. Mario has a very unique story that he's going to share with us today. Mario was very dear friends with Glenn Hughes, the leather man, and he's depicted right here behind us. So I'm going to start off a little bit here. We'll talk a little bit about Mario and what brought him to knowing Glenn Hughes. Then we'll talk about Glenn and some of the work that Mario's doing. So Mario, let's start off right now. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. It was very difficult for you. I, I born, I've been born, I was born in 1951, uh, born out of wedlock, been, in a, been raised in a, in a children's home, so to speak, orphanage. Came home when I was nine, ten years old, left my home when I was 18, and, uh, you know, doing the things that I had to do. Met my husband in um, 1975, but before that I was already, you know, doing my things in clubs like discotheques and so on. And I was involved in music, especially dance music. So um, I was living my life, so to speak. So in 1977, go very fast when I heard this, this music in discotheques at that time, I was totally flabbergasted. And then I heard this, these songs of a band called The Village People. Hmm. There was no picture of it. I just heard the music of it, San Francisco in Hollywood, you know, macho man, and it was fascinating for me. It had all the gay ingredients, but I could not relate to whatever it was. I could only relate to the music. There was no real picture of the group. So that's how it really started when I, you know, started to, inter to be interested in a group called Village People. That's how it started. But actually. taking a step back, mm -hmm. you, you indicated that when you stayed in the orphanage, that taught you some very useful disciplines that you are able to apply to your work now. Tell us a little bit about that. In the orphanage it was taught, you know, don't moan, do the things you have to do and don't talk about it, this is the way it is, and don't think about it. It was very sad in a way, but when I grew older I took it as an advantage in order to do something or to gain something. I still use it today, don't moan about it, this is what you have to do, and that's the goal, and it works in some way. So here I am, and uh, that's what I did. You alluded to music being very comforting to you, and you oh, even absolutely. said that you mentioned Billie Holiday's Lady in Satin okay. as being very, very important to you. Why is that? Tell us um, about it. Okay, okay, now okay. I have to go. I really have to tell the real story. Um, I was brought up in the orphanage without any love, you know, there was no comfort, there was absolutely nothing. So when I got home at 10, and, uh, you know, I didn't know who my father was, I didn't know who my mother was. I was brought up actually by nuns, and mm. um, so, but you have to, you have to find out things yourself. So, um, at first you hear music and okay, you like it. But the first album I bought, I, no, the, no, the first music I listened, I was able to listen to was Billie Holiday. And I didn't know who the, who the singer was. At first I thought it was a man because of Billie. Billie is, is a guy's name. But then I heard a voice, Billie Holiday, and um, Strange Food, that was the very first song. And when I, when I was 16 years old, I, uh, I bought the album Lady in Satin, and that was my first vinyl record that I bought for the price of 19 guilders and 90 cents, which was a huge amount of money. But I could afford it because I was working at clubs when I was 14, 15 years old. So I had money in order to buy vinyl. But Billie Holiday's Lady in Seven was my first bought album. That's how it all started with music and being comforted by the lyrics that Billie Holiday sang. That I could relate to it, more or less. What, what lyrics? does the song contain that are so uh, precious to you? About love, about man. You have to remember I was raised in the orphanage and there was, you know, you are not brought up with love, you know, you are brought up with surviving. 
and I so but I knew that I I was attracted to men when I was 13 14 years but not to boys my age but to men mm -hmm. elderly men not elderly men but you know men of 24 25 <laughs> older you know when you are 14 you know they, these are men you know so that's what happened so I have my first sexual relation not relationship my contact with a guy who was 24 25 and that didn't work out so when I heard Billy's songs, I said, okay, I can relate to that, as young as I was. What other music of Billie Holiday resonates with you? My man. I wanted to be hit by a man, but it never happened. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, I was very dramatic. I wanted to be loved by a man, and it never happened at that time. I just wanted to be loved because I had no love. So I did everything in order to get love or to be in love. And that was difficult. But, you know. What other music has had such an impact upon you? Pardon? What other music has had a similar impact upon you? The music, mm -hmm. most of the time it comforted me. I could relate to the lyrics, so to speak, but also could relate to the voices. Mainly I listened to female voices. Mm. Now it's a different story. The only, the only male voice I could relate to was Johnny Mathis. I like Johnny Mathis, so, you know, I started to buy albums of Johnny Mathis at that time. And next to that, I, I, I was young, so I wanted to have good times. So I was totally mesmerized by the Motown sound. And uh, being gay, of course, I loved the Supremes and the Motto Weaves and the Pandellas and the Marvelettes and all these wonderful ladies. So I could identify with all these groups. I was, you know, this is what it was. And that helped me in order to, to be, become who I am. But you said you've seen yourself as androgynous. How very do you mean? Um, I, was, I was a boy, but I was very skinny. I was very hairy. And I was very feminine. But I was not feminine as people thought. I was just who I was. I was not over the top, but still I was over the top. But it was totally myself, you know. I was totally myself. And I never excused myself for that. My mother told me that, you know, I've been bullied many, many times when I was 15, 16 years old. But my mother always said to me, never excuse your, your lifestyle, so to speak. So I, I, I never did. Um, but I had a very low self-esteem. I, mm -hmm. I have to admit that I didn't eat. I was very, very skinny. Being fat was a sin. So there was no fat in my, in my dictionary, so to speak. So I always wore black. I had very long hair. I curled my hair. And I was hairy. I was totally hairy. I was, you know, like this. I'm still very hairy. So, uh, but I was skinny, so I wore black clothes, black pants, black t-shirts, long t-shirts, and uh, as skinny as possible. But coming back to the music scene here in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. at the time that you discovered the village people in the 1970s, yeah. tell us a little bit about the gay scene here in Amsterdam at that time, what clubs were available? What kinds of things did you do? Oh, uh, I never participated in the gay in the gay clubs in Amsterdam, so to speak. I was then involved. I, I was then had a relationship with my husband, and we worked our asses off with with the with the photo industry. And he was a musician, so we were we were both involved in that aspect of life. We were making money. We were traveling around, and that's basically it. And because we were both involved in the music industry, I started to to um, to uh, how do we say that to d discover disco music. And when we went to clubs, it was like you know we went to the It Club and to other places, and that's basically it. basically it. I went to clubs in order to dance. I didn't need any other man because I had a man. I just danced my asses off. So, oops, that's what I did. And um, I, was not I was not involved in, with other men, or I had my own man. What sort of music was very popular here in Amsterdam at that time? Disco music, because I was only related to disco music at that time. And you mean about the 70s? Well, Late what 70s? stars were famous here that were also famous, for example, in, in England or the US or I have other no places? Idea. Okay. I have to tell you, I was not into pop music. I was okay. into Billie Holiday, Nancy Wilson, Diane Ross and the Supremes, Motown, 
and the American Songbook. Oh, okay. And I was not involved in pop music like Queen or, you know, it's okay. I, I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> All right. But, but what about stars like Gloria Gaynor? Or, that's or, disco. Or, I love disco. That's what I'm saying. See, yeah, you know, so. Tell never, me more about the disco people, the disco names you knew. Oh, when Yvonne I, Elliman, for example. Oh, when I was I, I was mm -hmm. living in the country when I was let's say twenty, and this and and, and, and Gloria Gamer came by, but I never can say goodbye, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went to all mm -hmm. these disco clubs in the southern part of the Netherlands where I lived. So I I spent my days in disco clubs all over the southern part of the Netherlands because I lived there. So yeah, um, Vicky Sue Robinson. Uh, Gloria Gaynor, The Trams, you name it, you know, and then suddenly you heard a song like Village People, you know, or San Francisco in Hollywood, you know, uh, everybody is a star. So I could relate to that as well, you know, lyric wise. And the beat, I loved the beat of the disco. Oh, please. It was the best. <laughs> <laughs> I was not involved in other things, just the beat, just, just let's move it. And it was a good exercise to stay skinny. Ah. Uh. You know. Take us to 1980, mm -hmm. when you met Glenn Hughes, the oh, leather man in the oh, Village People. Okay, I met, I met the Village People on April the 17th in New York at the Sigma Sound Studios. Before that, I already was involved more or less with, with the group. I, I became, or I proclaimed myself as president of the Dutch Village People fan club. So I put together a kind of, of a fan club magazine of a few pages, and I always sent it to the, um, to the company uh, in, in New York. And I always got mail back, so to speak. Thank you for your good work, keep up the good work. So in 1980, I, uh, I traveled to New York and I more or less announced myself, okay, I'm coming, uh, you know, I, I really want to meet you guys. So I went to the office and I was greeted very nicely by the producers, Chuck Murray and Henri Bololo. They were very, very nice to me. And then they um, offered, offered me, well, I, why don't you go with us to the Sigma Sound Studios where the group is? They are recording the music for Can't Stop the Music. Oh. So I said, okay, very happy, of course. So I, I went there and um, I got introduced by the, uh, by the producers to the group and they were all very, very cool and friendly. And um, also to Glenn Michael Hughes, of course. And what I did was I had for each member, I had a, a question list when each member had to fill in a, a list of 10 questions. So I had 60 answers. And uh, I more or less demanded it, so to speak. <laughs> and they were impressed by that. So that was a good sign. And um, after, the, after we met in the studios, uh, the, the road manager, Richard Greener, asked me, why don't you join us to have some lunch at a Thai restaurant somewhere on Broadway? And I said, yes, okay, I will do that. So, you know, I went with them to a Thai restaurant and it was very nice, very okay. I was tense, I was a fan, I was not a friend, I was just a fan. So when we said goodbye, Glenn Michael, he said to me, keep writing. And I thought by myself, sure, I, anyway. So I wrote him a letter, thank you for everything, but I wrote to all members a letter. You know, and also to the producer, thank you for, for being so nice to me. But um, he was the one who, who replied me. And uh, from then on, it really started to develop some kind of friendship, so to speak, or, you know, we got to know each other a little bit better. That's how it really started, April 17, 1980. What were your impressions of the various members of the village people? Uh, there, you... Obviously, there were six people. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about each one of them. What's, what stays in your mind? What stays in my mind is that they were very cool. Cool, they were okay. They, they, they were, um, they had no, they were not up now, so to speak. They were very, very nice. And, and they, they were relaxing, and that's what, I, that's what I liked. They were like you and I, you know. They had no, um, they were not arrogant. That's what I liked about them. And they were surprised that I knew so, so much about disco music. Not even about them, but about other people, you know. So it was my enthusiasm. And they were very nice to me, absolutely. And the producer itself, a producer like Jacques, he was very kind to me. Very, very kind to me, so to speak. But I rejected that. So, um, so it, yeah. I. I just wanted to be, I just wanted to get in touch with the group in order to make my club bigger. That's, that was the main 
a main thing, so to speak. I have no other intention in order to... No, not at all. How were the village people formed? The village people were formed by Jacques Morali. They were um, put together by Can Stop Productions, by an ad. And, um, you know, they had to apply, and they all did auditions. Uh, Victor Willis was then the lead singer. He was already into the group. And Alex Briley was a friend of Victor Willis, the soldier. And they needed more, four more characters in order to form a band. And Glenn was one of them. And he was uh, a toll collector at the Brooklyn Battery. Battery. Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Why? The Brooklyn? Yes, he was an Brooklyn officer. Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Exactly. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they saw him. He had his, you know, this attitude and this mustache. And he was just in. And um, that's how it all started with them. And Wendy, the cowboy, and David was on Broadway. Randy was on Broadway, so they all needed a job. And, you know, let's define, we have to find a job in order to support ourselves. That's how it really started. And Felipe, was, Felipe the Indian was already involved in the project Village People with Jacques Morali and Henry Bololo with the, first, with the very first album, Village People. So Glenn went from being a toll collector yeah. to being in a singing group. How was his persona developed? He was, he was the son of a policeman, and his mother was a former tap dancer in the circus. His grandmother was um, a trapeze artist in Barnum's and Bailey. Oh. So, um, and they lived in Bethpage on Long Island, and he was you know, blue -collar, um, a blue-collar family person. But um, he always wanted to be in show business. His mother was in show business. His grandmother was in show business. So he, was, he wanted to be in show business. So uh, he, he read the ad and, you know, more or less did his thing and did an audition for village people. And uh, as far as I know, what he told me, that was his life. He always wanted to be in show business. Um, he auditioned and he did two songs from the musical Hair, um, Where Do I Go and Let the Sun Shine In, I believe. No, Aquarium, sorry, Aquarium. And he was, okay. Did he have to sing these a cappella? Yes. To he the had, producers? Yes, he had okay. to do a cappella, just, just a bar, so to speak. And, but also because of his looks, you know, he had this, 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 this masculine, masculine look. And the, day, and, 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 the, and the producers wanted to have a leather, a leather man, you know, that can apply into, you know, there's all the different characters. And he was the perfect guy for it. Why so? Of his looks and his and his attitude, he was very handsome. He was hairy, you know. The pre, the producer itself, himself, Jacques, was gay. He was a gay man, so he thought, "Oh, Glenn is very very nice." <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> so that's also one of the reasons that Glenn was into the group. How did Glenn uh, acquire the image that we see here on screen? His cover, his his chains, his leathers. Were those things that he already had? No. No, no, no. He, he was given by the producers an amount of $1,000, and he was sent to uh, Mr. Leather in New York. There's a store in the village, and they said to him, here's your $1,000, uh, $1, and buy yourself some leather so that you can become the leather man of the village people. So he was given 1000 and he, sp he spent 1000 and came back with all this leather, this leather goods. And he, he created the, the leather man from scratch, from zero to... You know, he crystallized more or less over the years the Leatherman character. And he was very good in it, absolutely. He, uh, you know, but, you know, he, he loved it as well. You know, the more he created it, the more he became a part of the character as well, as far as I can consider. You know, he loved it. He loved it very much. Village people was his life. Were there various uh, items in his leather closet that he preferred over others? Not in the beginning, I suppose, but later on, he, um, he, loved, he loved his character, but he also loved his, 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 um, his gear, so, so to speak, but it was only on stage. But when, he, when, when the group became bigger and bigger, he also let made custom-made uh, vests, you know, and, and buckles. Like this buckle, for instance, he, um, he wore a lot of on times on stage, and it became also his nickname was Mr. Eagle, and that's because yeah. of the of this buckle that he um, 
that he wore. And uh, yeah, we have a photo here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the audience can see this very well. Mm. It's it's Glenn wearing a studded um, vest. Yes. You have this vest in your home. Yes, that's correct. And I have to say it's an amazing piece of work. It's it is. truly breathtaking in its complexity and its personality. What about this can you tell me? This is so iconic. What can you tell me about this vest? Actually, is you know he was, Glenn was a very, he was interesting so to speak. Um, um, he didn't, he was very down to earth first of all, but he didn't put any um, any value to the things that he owned. So I was the one later years that I took care of the leather, that I took care of this vest because it was totally damaged and I more or less restored it. He didn't put any attention to it if it was kaput or not, doesn't matter. So I fixed it to this, what, what it is today. Actually, he owned two. And um, one was given away by his mother to the church because the mother had no idea how valuable the vest was. And, more, wow. and, and I more or less saved the vest. Wow. Because he said, when I'm gone, please take the vest. I said, okay, I'm going to take care of it. So the same about the buckle. He, he loved it, but he had no clue how valuable it actually was. Uh -huh. He was very, you know, he was not into material things. He was very down to earth. Okay. That was, you know, I like that about him. So tell me how your relationship with Glenn began to evolve. What sorts of things were you able to do with Glenn that, for example, someone special might be able to do? Well, first of all, I was a fan, and um, he, uh, he started to write me, and I responded, and, you know, we go, you go back and forth in a correspondence. And, but I also started to, more, to get bigger and bigger in my so-called Dutch fan club of village people. And at a certain point, uh, the, the company Can Stop Productions decided that I would become international because of my, of my work, what I, was, what I was doing for the group. And in 1983, I was, in, I was, um, in, no, I was invited by the group to, com to come to Las Vegas to see their shows for seven days. So I, I accepted the invitation. The invitation came actually from Glenn. So um, I went to Vegas, first two days to New, to New York, blah, 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 and then off to Vegas. And they had um, an engagement at the Riviera Hotel in the Versailles Room, a capacity of 800 people, twice, two shows a night. So um, I remember when I came by taxi to the, to the hotel, and they, Glenn and Alex were waiting for me at, outside the hotel. and. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of nervous. I've never been to Vegas before. I was to New York, okay, but Vegas totally new to me. Anyway, they, um, they picked me up from the hotel, blah, 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 and um, Glenn said to me, come to my apartment, to, to my suite, so to speak. And um, I said, okay. And, you know, he was very okay. And suddenly he said to me, why don't you come sit next to me on the bed? And, and then he put his, his hand on my lap and said, I'm so happy that you're here. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, what's going to happen right now? And then he, he really looked me deep into the eyes and said, if it wasn't for you, I would jump out of the building right now. And I remember, wow. and I remember saying to him, well, before you jump out of, out of the building, let me do the shopping first. And, you know, I thought that was not funny to say, but it came out of, you know, out of my mouth. He started to laugh so loud, so loud, he couldn't stop laughing. And then I think because of my answer, that really gave us a click, that gave us a bond, you know. And then I realized that he was very depressive. I was depressive at that time as well because I was in a seven-year seven itch with, with the man I was living with. So, you know, we were, you know, we were there. And... Um, then he said, okay, I'm going to take care of you this coming, these coming days. Don't you worry, I'll show you wherever you have to go. And he said, I want you to be in the showroom uh, five days here, uh, five, five shows here and five shows backstage so that you can do your work. And that's what I did. And he took care of me, and uh, I, it was wonderful days. I never saw daylight. I partied all night long and slept, through the, and slept um, during the day because it was too hot. 
and the midnight shower started at 12 and you know ended at 2 and what, what do you do in Vegas after 2 you party so <laughs> and you go to bed at 4 in the morning or 5 in the morning <laughs> so you don't get up and then at 4 you know you eat something and then the day starts it's a totally different rhythm and there were no clocks so and I was young you know I was, I was 32 33 you mentioned Glenn being depressive what what does that mean what was going on there I believe he was depressive of um, he had a very low self-esteem as I as I could um, but I, I at that time I didn't know what was going on the only thing that I know that he could be very depressive but I but I found it out later in my relationship with Glenn what really happened but you know at that time he was you know uh, when he was on stage, when he was the character, he was okay. He was the best man you could ever be with. But in his private life, he was he was 100, 180 degrees different. And I started to see that. But I couldn't put my finger on it. I was too young to know. I know that I was depressive at times. So we were two lost souls, so to speak. You know, I never mentioned it to others, never. No, it was so-called secret between us. But over time, knowing Glenn, mm -hmm. what did you come to understand about that? Like I said, he had a very low self-esteem, and he was not very happy with the life that he was living. He had everything. He had money, obviously fancy clothes, obviously traveling the world and meeting famous people. Why, why would he not be happy? I asked him that many times, but... I believe people don't have an answer for that. He didn't have an answer for that. He just didn't feel well. Um, it could happen just like that. That you know, in in the late in in the mid nineties, when I started to live with him, when I was with him, he became manic depressive. The, the disease became worse and worse, and and that was frightening for me as well. But I never blamed him for that. But you know, it it was a disease that more more or less developed more and more to that. But on stage, you couldn't even, you didn't notice. At that time, in that environment, mm -hmm. clearly drugs were a major player, especially yes. in the disco scene and at that time in entertainment history. Was this an issue for Glenn? No, he was drug free. He was drug free. He only drank champagne, as far as I know, and some wine. But no beer, as far as I know, no drugs. Drugs was a no-no because his father was, was a very strict cop. And when he was a young kid, his father showed him many, many times the bad sides of uh, of reality. So his father took him in his in his in his car and showed him Forty Second Street and said, "This is the other side of reality. Don't you ever do this?" So Glenn was warned. So he never did any drugs. He was very strict. He was very conservative in that. He never tried it. And uh, I never did drugs either. So. Um, that had to be a challenge because clearly a lot of people in oh, that it industry. There. It was right there in front of you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, you because know, yeah, absolutely. And at the times when I was with Glenn, it was even offered to you. Like sex was offered, drugs was offered as well. It was very easy and very attractive, of course. But he never he never used it. How was Glenn about managing his uh, fortune, for example? His father took care of that. Oh, okay. His father was um, his father took care of him. So when Glenn passed away, he, he, he died as a millionaire. His father was the businessman. He was very taken care of, 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 of Glenn, as well as the other members of the village people. He took care of the finances of village people. He did. That had to be quite something for a blue-collar cop in suburban New York City, having a son in a basically gay... Um, iconic situation. How did his family cope with Glenn's circumstances and the others? That was very funny. I, I still believe till today Glenn was in show business and they loved it and they never brought up the gay aspect of Glenn. Never ever, never ever have I heard his father say to me that his, father, that his son was gay nor his mother. They were just very proud of their son. Basically. Did Glenn ever bring a boyfriend home? Yes, but that, but, but that was never mentioned as a boyfriend. The carpenter. Let me put it that way. So no, it was 
it was never mentioned. The, the word gay was never mentioned. Not even when I was there. I was his, I was his friend from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Oh. No. Homosexuality was a no-no, I believe, according to his father. His mother was more flexible, I have to say that. Mother was very religious, so okay. But his father was very, very strict and very conservative. I... Um, <laughs> In 1986, I uh, I was introduced to his father at his place in Bethpage, and the first thing that Glenn said to me was, if you're going to meet my father, don't even mention um, um, religion and that you're gay and blah, blah, blah. Mm. So, I, so I was there in five minutes, and religion was already on the table, and being gay was on... Yes, anyway. Was it good or bad that this was the case? His father was shocked by my... Because I'm from Europe, I'm from the Netherlands, so hey... Being gay is not an issue for me, and religion, hey, you can discuss religion. So he was shocked, but still, I was I was a good friend of Glenn, according to, to Patrick, his father. I went along with Patrick because I knew where he came from. I never judged his father. This is what he is. He had his own demons to, to deal with. That's why I always thought, always said it to Glenn, please don't hate your father. He's a victim of whatever. That's very progressive. Always think <clears> like that. But how did Glenn manage to balance his religious convictions with the circumstances he was in with the village people? Glenn was raised Catholic, yes? Yes, Roman Catholic. How did he cope with that religious element to his life? No, that, that was no issue. He, uh, he, uh, he abandoned his religious background totally. He okay. didn't believe in that. It, it, it had no value for him. He, uh, he was more um, into, um, how do you say that, um, a atheism? Yes, atheism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very, uh, it's a big step. For yeah. him, probably. Uh, he had many conflict with, conflicts with his father. His father was a very strict religious man, Patrick. His mother was, you know, the most sweetest woman, an angel in, in the house, taking care of her boy, so to speak, of her husband and her son, and later the boy from, the, the friend from Amsterdam, mm -hmm. taking care of her boys. That's what she always said. Dolores was a sweetheart, still is. We, we spoke a moment ago about the drug scene mm -hmm. in um, the entertainment industry and the recording industry at that time. What about sex? Clearly, you've got six iconic-looking men who represent numerous elements of the, the gay community. There had to be tons of boys and men throwing themselves at these guys. How did Glenn and the others manage that? Oh, that was very funny. I never did. I never participated <laughs> in it, please. I was very shy. Anyway, so I didn't do that. I had my reasons for that. But Glenn, you know, Glenn stayed in the character of village people, the letterman. So, you know, it was, you know, presented to him, you know, in a silver plate. And he, you know, he took care of that. And um, everybody did, except for a few from the group. And I've seen, I've seen it happen. I always kept my mouth shut, of course. You don't talk about like that. You, you, all, you, go, you don't go into public. You don't do that, you know. It's, it's a code. You don't talk about it. But I've seen it happen, of course. And, and, and men were ridiculous, stupid. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and they, you know. Glenn was just presenting a character, so to speak. But there were these, there were these guys who really thought he was the real character in real life, and that did, he, he wasn't like that. It was his job, so to speak. So, Well, tell us about real life. If Glenn uh, were just... A regular person, what sort of things did he like or what things did he do? When I was with Glenn, we watched TV shows like Touch with an Angel and we stopped together, so to speak. You know, we went out for shopping, we went out to disco sto to, to record stores, we did our shopping, we, you know, and we watched TV. That's basically it. And he cooked for me and I cooked for him. And there was no heavy duty leather scene at all, as far as I know as far as I've experienced it. But when he was into his character on stage, it was a different agenda and a different person. And I, I could totally understand it because it was the way he was. He was like Jacqueline Hyde at times. 
Uh, and that also had to do with his, um, with, with his um, depressions. He could be Jekyll and Hyde at the same time. And that was not a nice side of a beautiful side of Glenn Michael Hughes. And I could relate to it more or less because I recognized it more or less. But it was very, very sad at times. So on stage and off stage, when he was still in the character, he was the best leather man you could ever imagine. When he was out of the Letterman character, he was the best friend you could ever have. I had the most wonderful times with him. When I visited your home mm. and I saw, for example, uh, the vest that we mentioned earlier. Yes. Uh, seeing that and seeing some other things of Glenn's that you have. Glenn was physically very small. He was. He hated sports. And that's, that was surprising to me. Well, at, at, at that time, it was not really necessary to do sports. You have to remember, this is the 70s, the 80s. So today, it's a total different story. You have to be masculine in order. And, but at those, at those days, it didn't, didn't really matter. Plus, he was covered in leather. Yes, 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 yes. Who cares? So Glenn uh, really has the image here. I mean, we can see he's got his cover. He's got his shades. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the mustache alone, I think a lot of men would love right. to be able to have that. I've tried growing my mustache like that. I can't quite get it to the same volume right. that Glenn has here. Right. So another iconic uh, image of Glenn here. This is where I really think Glenn is the most attractive is when he's like dressed like this. That's yeah. when he really shows sort of that badass element, I guess. Pardon? You know? The badass yes, element. Yes, he could be. Yeah. He could be like that to me as well. He could be yeah. very, very badass. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you and, love a man, you, you love a man. That's basically it. And we've got a picture of Glenn here, the center of yes. um, of the group of the village the, people. The disco group of village people. Yes. You know, yes. They look, yeah. mm. there, there's an interesting bit to this as we, as we explore Glenn and the rest of the people in the group. They originally, were they not simply to be performers? And then there was some arrangement made for them to actually record the music? That's so, what's Say that again. I, they actually recorded, and that's of course where the the money came from, and their fortunes came from. Were, were the, because their actual voices were recorded. That was the very first group, and yeah. the producer had to find the characters because the mm -hmm. first group was very successful, but the first album was recorded by studio singers. Yeah, and yeah. the group was not even formed, so that's why. Um, the second album, Macho Man, was produced, and then you came, then and then came in Glenn, Wendy, and the other members. Oh, so I then see. the group became a face, you know. I see. And that's how it was. That's how it worked. Yeah. yeah. There's Glenn again in his another iconic look here. Yes. Yeah. This is a very famous photo, but you can actually see his his waistline. I I don't think I've seen a waistline on myself like that in. 40 years. This is taken in 19, <laughs> 1998, two days before, not two days, two, two years before he passed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's explore that a little bit. Um, tell us about Glenn's health. It, it deteriorated toward the end there. Tell us what was happening with Glenn. Um, Glenn lived a, how do you say it, lived a, you know, easy lifestyle, so to speak. And um, in 1980, after we met in, in Vegas, our friendship became very close, so to speak. So we, were very, we started to, to be friends, you know, and he explained me very explicit things about his sexual life and things like that. And um, in 1986, he, um, I got a phone call from London and um, it was Glenn saying that he was not doing very well and that he was HIV. And I was, <laughs> I more or less expected that, but I was so fucking angry. So I, I hang up the phone and um, I was angry about the fact that he was only, that he only had five years to live and our friendship would end within five years. So I didn't judge him, I was just pissed off by it in any way. So after a few minutes, he called me back and he said, are you going to leave me? I said, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm just fucking angry that you're so stupid to get infected, you know. So, uh, but you know, our friendship grew stronger for that. And um, 
um, what do you do? Uh, friendship has, I always call, I always consider friendship as, as a wave, you know, as the sea, you have ebb and tide, you have ebb and tide, you, you know, so this was, this is what it is, you know, you, so, okay, this is what it is, I, it's not my life, it's your life, but if I'm, if I'm going to have to take care of you, you, I take care of you, you took care of me, I take care of you, no question, and that's what I did. From, sick, from from the day that he told me that he was HIV. But he didn't have full-blown AIDS then. That, that happened years later. So um, being uh, I, 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 HIV didn't stop him to perform with a group or doing good thing. Nobody knew, so hey, you know. But he was he di diagnosed, that's, that's true. But for me it was no issue. As, as Glenn's health deteriorated, mm -hmm. What were you able to do for him? Help him and listen to him. And one of the, when he was very, very sick, he, uh, he, he uh, I was living with him in New York. And what I still remember is what he said, AIDS gave me all the freedom I needed in the world. And I, I couldn't relate to that. So what the fuck are you saying to me? But now I understand, I'm older now, and, you know, but that, you know, he taught me a lot about life, about a real thing, what's going on in life. He really taught me about it. And uh, I, you know, what I did was help him and listen to him and take the best what I could do. And, you know, what can you do? You do things without questioning it. If you love someone, if there's true love, you do it. I don't even, I, I still do that. I don't even question it. That's the way it is. Take it or leave it. So that's what I did. And um, I'm, I'm okay with it. I still miss him, but but he was the best friend. I had I had a love of my life, which is which is my husband, but I had the best 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 friend, and that was Glenn Michael Hughes. He was my best friend ever, ever. You have a lot of Glenn's things. Yes. When I visited your home, you showed me all kinds of memorabilia, mm -hmm. gold records. How did you come to have those items? When he was passing away, when he was dying, he said to me, I want you to have this and take care of it. And uh, I, I, I uh, more or less refused it. I said, I don't want it. Please don't do this to me. He said, I want you to have it. You have to take care of it. And perhaps you can make money out of it. Well, we are 20 years later and didn't make any money out of it. It's still in my house because I cannot do it. But like the buckle and some other things uh, he gave to me and he said, um, I want you to wear it on gay events and things like that. I said, okay, I will respect that. So that's what I do. I wear it on gay events and other events that I think is important and wear Glenn stuff. That's what I do. And it's still in my house. And uh, it's now time to do something with it. And um, it's time to pass it on. Um, Glenn had a copy of this of this buckle. And I gave it to his succeeder, to Eric Anzalone, three years ago, while Eric was here in, in Amsterdam. And I said, this is for you. And uh, he was totally uh, surprised by it and I said, well, Glenn would have loved it and he is uh, smiling at you because you're doing a great job, you know, being the succeeder of Glenn. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm trying to pass it on, which is okay, but it's still difficult, but it's okay. It's always hard to say goodbye to things that you love, but it's okay. It's also give me some more freedom as well. But not only Glenn's things mm -hmm. continue, Mm -hmm. You told me that Glenn's financial uh, contributions benefit or benefited a lot of people, families, yes. for example. Yes, that's correct. When I was <clears throat> working for, uh, I've worked for the group for about uh, uh, 17 years. And Glenn was the only man in the group who, um, who uh, stayed in touch with his fan base. So every year when I was there, I had to select all the addresses on the system. And uh, the young women and the young men at that time were 22, 20, whatever, 20 years. 20 years later, they were 40, 44, whatever. But it turned out when he passed away that he had supported four families, mm -hmm. four, four mm -hmm. friends who had created a family. And he had supported all these families, four families, as a matter of fact. And um, nobody knew. Even I didn't know that. So he, he had a heart of gold. He was a very, very good man. Uh, it's his religious background, I suppose, you know. Do those families still benefit? 
I don't know. I I really don't know. I just found it. I just found out, and his mother was even surprised by that. Wow. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I really don't know. Well, the only thing that I took care of was keeping the addresses on. Um, oh, okay. You know, that's what I. That's one of one of my jobs. I did a lot of work for them. You are working on a very big project yes. now about the village people, about Glenn Hughes. True. Tell us about that. What are you doing? Um, it's in the process, so to speak. So what I'm doing is I'm trying, or I'm not trying, I'm putting together all the things that I think is important for a photo art book. And the work title is My Journey with Glenn Michael Hughes. And it will include all, all the material that, that he produced as well as never ever seen uh, published ma- photo material, DMOs that I you know that I can do, memorabilia that I will photograph, um, letters, interviews that I had with the group from 1980 till 1986. So it's going to be huge. Uh, there is so much that, that has to be in the book. So I'm talking about at least 300 pages. Wow. And it's wow. a coffee table size, so yeah. album size. It's not going to be a small book. So um, I'm working it on it, let's say, two or three hours a day. And uh, it's going to be huge. And it's also a tribute to Glenn, you know, to, to, uh, to close off, you know, to, to make the close disclosure. And uh, it's, it's a hell of a job. It, it puts me also back in the time when I was working for, for, for the book. And I have I have so many material from the book as well from the record from the record companies at that time. I was I was supported by many record companies worldwide because I was working for the group. And I kept everything. Everything. Every little scribble, everything. Even personal notes from Glenn and the guys to me. So, you know, there is a lot. It's so much. I was I was going through through my closet today and i and I realized, oh dear, I have also Five tour jackets that I have <laughs> put them some, somewhere, you know, and leather gear, and I have uh, his um, his chaps, his buckles, his vests, his shirts. I kept everything because he wanted me to have it. So that's what I, you know. So, what okay. are you going to do with these items, especially the gold records? These are very valuable items. I have no idea. Today is today. Tomorrow is another day. Mm. I always believe that uh, that uh, you know. You know, it will work out fine. I I believe in that. Today is today. Okay. Tomorrow is another day. People will come to me. Whatever. It always worked that way. You know, okay. uh, time is running out. I I understand that. But you know, so far so good. There are always vibes or or energies that come in your way and taking care of you. I always believed in it. I always believe that in my friendship with Glenn. You know, I still do that. I, he's still in. He's still in my life, although he's not physical. And, but you know, yeah, he's still there, and that's good. I miss him, but you know, it's. I'm. I, today I can say I'm very thankful that we had this friendship for twenty two years. How, how lucky can you get? Mario, I would like to thank you very, very much. My pleasure for participating in Inside Leather History, the okay. Fireside Chat. Yeah. Again, doing something different, not necessarily old timers being interviewed, but something unique.